Hi, I'm Rachel Tamer Bussell. I'm the editor in chief of Residence 11, and uh, we are here doing an interview with August McLaughlin ahead of our first live event on February 11th, which is going to be the Residence 11 Desire Summit on Sex and Relationships. And if you're not familiar with our site, residence11.com, we're a website and community that celebrates sensuality, romance, intimacy, and loving in a new age of human connection. So please check it out because we have lots of amazing articles. Uh, so uh, today we are talking to August McLaughlin, who's a journalist, author of several books, and host and producer of Girl Boner Radio which was named one of the best sex podcasts you should be listening to in 2022 by Romper and one of the top feminist podcasts by Belessa. Her articles and expertise have been featured in a range of publications, including Cosmopolitan, The Washington Post, Fame Magazine, O, The Oprah Magazine, Forbes, and Shape. She's also a certified sex educator with related expertise in eating disorders and ADHD. And you can find out more about her at augustmclaughlin.com. And you can find Girl Boner wherever you listen to podcasts. And August is going to be speaking at the upcoming Residence 11 Desire Summit along with her co author, Jamila Dawson. And they're going to be talking about the topic of erotic rituals. So make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're watching this so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming interviews. And now let's jump right in and talk to August. And if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments and we'll try to get to them. So August, before I get to your career, can you tell us what you were taught about sex growing up and how your views have changed over time? Yeah, I was taught that sex is a private activity that you don't really talk about, that it's something reserved for marriage uh, between a man and a woman who want to have babies. <laughs> And I also, in various ways, learned that sex is this man's thing um, and boy's thing. And they've changed in completely every way <laughs> since then. I talk about sex all the time. Um, I think it's for everyone who wants to enjoy it. And yeah, and I'm always still learning. But those messages definitely felt wonky at the time. Uh, but it took me a long time to unpack all those those weird messages um and i'm curious i mean i'm sure it wasn't just one thing or one moment but how did your views change like how what kind of led you to have that change one of the first changes for me came when a friend of mine came out as a gay and i remember the church community that i was a part of uh, I went to for support to support my friend, just to be like, you know, how can I be helpful? Because I know there's resistance around this where we were. And I was told really negative things. So I left that community immediately. So I was like, that makes no sense. Um, and then the next thing that happened was after high school, I was working in the fashion industry and I struggled with a really severe eating disorder and embracing my sexuality really helped me heal. Um, I credit it for saving my life, really. So that happened, I was probably around 20-ish. And then about 10 years after that, I embraced self-pleasure for the first time. Prior to that, I really had seen sex as this thing that was dependent on another person. And even though I had challenged those messages, I still absorbed them to some degree. And that completely changed everything for me. I was just so blown away by the pleasure my body could feel um, and, and kind of the sacred experience that was to, to, to have that pleasure completely on my own. And that's really when I decided to launch Girl Boner. Um, so I do want to hear more about Girl Boner, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about self-pleasure and why that was so impactful versus maybe sexual exploration with other people, because I think that's something people of all genders can relate to, 
And for a lot of people, we're not only not really taught about sex ed and what we do with other people, but we're not, we're definitely not taught about what to do with ourselves. Like I didn't know about vibrators, I think until I bought my first one, also like early twenties and it was life changing. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. I did learn a lot through partnered sex and I enjoyed sex. I found it to be pleasurable. Once I really started to embrace my sexuality, that was powerful. Like my partnered sex was much more pleasurable and exciting and exploratory. But there was something I think also as somebody who was reared, reared as a girl who identifies as a woman, where our sexuality often does not feel like our own. We are objectified in so many different ways. And I was working in the fashion industry too. So it's like, I was like selling sex as a model. And so it's really fascinating to me that even though I was in this really adult industry that supposedly is quite sexual and like it's energy and everything, um, I, I didn't have that sense of autonomy or strength or confidence for me in particular, I found that not having self-pleasure in my life led me to get into a lot of relationships that weren't ideal for me, sometimes were harmful for me because that was my only outlet. And when I embraced my sexuality as my own and I embraced self-pleasure, it also changed the rest of my life, not just sexually, but I felt stronger as, a, as an individual. Um, I felt stronger walking around. I felt more confident in my work. Um, it was just very freeing because there was this one part of my identity and myself and my life that kind of had been put on the back burner um, and no more. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, we may return to that just because I think that that is so that is a big hurdle for a lot of people. I think they sense that there is more to sex and sexual pleasure, but they don't quite know how to access it. So that kind of brings me to Girl Boner. Um, first of all, why did you decide to start it? And why did you pick the name Girl Boner? Yeah, and so- tell us a little more about what it is. I mean, I said it's a podcast, but it's. I think it's a little more than that. So can you share that? Too? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the history of the term actually goes back decades because when I was in fourth grade, I had that really awkward sex ed class that a lot of us have had where it's all fear-based and I learned a little bit like quote unquote male pleasure, pleasure for someone with a penis was alluded to. I remember learning that an erection could happen and there could be pleasure, etc. And I only learned things that sounded pretty daunting for somebody who had a body like mine. And so I remember being out at recess and hearing boys talk about boners. And as soon as I realized, oh, that's what they're talking about, my first thought was, what about girl boners? And that curiosity stayed with me. Um, it later became this sort of joke term uh, for myself with partners, um, sometimes with friends, just talking about turn on and excitement for sex. And so when I was going through all this growth in my own life, this term was already really valuable to me. And so I do use it to mean physical arousal for any femme or woman, regardless of your genitalia. I also think it's very important to know that the clitoris does get erect and engorged and all of that. A lot of folks um, don't know that. So that's one piece of it. But girl boner to me represents so much more um, the term and also the work that I do, it's, it feels more um, about self-embracement, embracing our capacity for pleasure, and also challenging damaging myths and stereotypes because people don't like hearing the word girl with boner. And when I say people, generally people are excited about it and I get a lot of um, you know smiles and I like that it has a fun feeling. But when you think about the messaging we get from society, it the idea that a girl could have like a sexual turn on and in this way that has been very um kind of you know we've sort of been brainwashed to believe that it is this quote unquote male experience so i i do address a lot of 
myths and challenges. It started as a um, blog series after what I call the orgasm that changed my life, that solo play session. And the blog series led to um, my books and also my podcast, which is my main focus now. And I do a lot of true storytelling because I think it's really important for us to hear about each other's experiences. I think we learn a lot and it's really fun. I just, I love stories and I think they can help change the world. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask you one, a, a little more about the podcast. Just, um, I think your mic is scratching against your shirt a little bit. Oh, is it? Okay. I'll hold it out. Is this better? I think so. Yeah. Um, okay. So because the the title is Girl Boner and you just addressed, you know, why you call it that, who is your main audience? Like, is it mostly women or is it a mix of people? And I mean, is it ever, do people ever think it's only for women because of the name? Yeah, I think some people probably do. Um, the book series definitely is geared toward women and femmes and people reared as girls. Um, but the podcast, I did start out thinking that I would focus more on kind of female sexuality. And it still is through like a femme lens, but it's really evolved to become a place for people who are interested in sex in general. Um, a lot of people are on their own self-embracement journeys and exploring sex. And so I'm really very pleased to have a very, very diverse audience in pretty much every way, um, age-wise as well, um, identities, but gender too. I think the last time I checked, it skews slightly uh, female, but it's also reaches a lot of people who identify as male too. Um, so yeah, I think we all need to be part of these conversations and and I'm grateful that that people don't think they can't listen because they, they aren't a woman. I think that's really important. And what topics would you say have been most popular? And and also, what 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 would you say are your have been your favorite topics? I, I know there's been many dozens, so or more. I don't know how many, but I mean, there's been a lot, so it might be hard to narrow down. But maybe like two or three of your favorites and uh, most popular. Yeah. Well, one topic that's very popular and is also probably my favorite or among my favorites are incredible orgasm stories. I'm sure some of that comes from the fact that that has been such a huge turning point for me, um, but it's something that we don't hear much about and that there's so much variance in. There are so many different stories that I think we can relate to a little bit in some ways or that we have never experienced and I love that. So I have a, an ongoing series of incredible orgasm stories. Um, and they always end up being so much more than about orgasms or even about sex. Um, lately, I've been getting a lot of folks reaching out with their awakening stories. These times in your life where you have a big pivot. Um, recently, I, I did a couple of episodes on women in their 40s who had a very dramatic and positive shift in their sexuality, which is a narrative that we aren't kind of fed. And they were like, wait, is this normal? Like I'm having a great sex life and I heard that things were going to fizzle away. Um, and then I would say lately, I've also heard more from people who are curious about different kinks and fetishes. And either they want to know about um, their own interest, they want to know if other people are into it too, uh, there other times, they want to know about other people's like they're curious they want to understand like a partner's i'm not sure if i lost you rachel can you hear me okay I think Rachel might be frozen, but I am here. Should I keep talking? Let me see. Oh, I see a question in the chat. How has your own life changed due to being so involved in the sexuality field? Oh gosh, uh, it's given me incredible meaning to work in this field. I have also met so many incredible people. So I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I've never lost interest. <laughs> it's just a really fun and exciting and challenging space to be. I mean, certainly it's hard to 
talk about topics that are stigmatized so much. As I'm sure you know, Rachel, it's hard to like promote things that involve sex. It's hard to be able to speak about things like social media or on social media to talk about, you know, whatever content you're creating. And so there are some difficult things, lots of hurdles, but those just kind of remind me that this is, you know, this is important stuff. Like everyone who's in this field, we, we need to keep doing it. Okay, so I'm gonna keep answering questions that are in the chat box here. Okay. So I answered that one, how my life has changed. Okay, here's another one. Can you tell us more about your book, With Pleasure, Managing Trigger Traumas for More Vibrant Sex and Relationships that you co-authored with Jamila Dawson? And what led us to write it? What's something we want readers to take away? Yeah, so With Pleasure, um, a couple of years ago, gosh, it was 2019, I was working on a book that was inspired a lot by my own experience having some complex trauma come up, which I think a lot of folks were experiencing, especially in like 2016, which was a rough year for, for me and for a lot of, lot of people. And uh, I was really fascinated by this idea of triggers, like what happens, it, it fascinated me and as challenging and painful as it was to deal with, I also wanted to explore like what's happening in the brain and the body and all of that. And because I'm in sex ed, of course, I was going to talk about sexuality and pleasure, but they weren't the main focus. And then enter Jamila Dawson, who is an incredible sex therapist. I interviewed her for my podcast and she was talking about trauma and pleasure in ways that I found so refreshing and she's a brilliant speaker. And I felt like she must be an excellent writer too. Like, just writing down the words she was saying would be a great book. <laughs> and at first I thought, well, maybe she should write this book. But then I realized that we could really complement each other. And so the focus shifted to be much more about pleasure, so much so that the title changed to With Pleasure. And it's also full of true stories about managing trauma. And then Jamila responds to each one. She has a, a section throughout the book called Jamila's Reflections. And we also talk about ways to find community support. And we really want people to know that you can experience pleasure throughout the most difficult times in your life. And that's not to say, oh, just be happy. It's actually the opposite of that. We are very not into that kind of self-help where it's like, just change how you feel. That'll be great. <laughs> course, but how? Um, so instead, it's it's about honoring ourselves, honoring our feelings, and also knowing that we can experience pleasure throughout those times and that that pleasure can actually strengthen us in our journey and make the healing process more um, smooth in a way, more fulfilling. And and yeah, and that you can have a, a fantastic sex life, even when you're managing trauma, and so many people are, and it's it's actually medicinal to have that kind of pleasure. Um, let's see, so I think another question is coming. Oh, and Rachel's back. I apologize for that. Um, uh, so can you, did, um, I don't know if we covered this, but I know you're speaking with your co-author, Jamila Dawson, about erotic rituals at the Desire Summit. Can you tell us a little bit more about what are erotic rituals and why are they important? And also, I was curious, because I don't know the answer to this, do they have to be done with a partner or can they be done by themselves? Great question. So when we think about rituals in general, a ritual is something that we return to that essentially brings us back to ourselves and brings us into the present moment. And there are so many benefits known that are linked with rituals of all kinds. So people feel more relaxed, they feel more confident, they have better mental health. I mean, even simple things like before interviews, I always have tea from like my favorite mug. We do these things that it's like self-soothing. It's also celebrating our values, you know, what matters to us. And so, when you bring sex into that and eroticism, it's so exciting uh, for a number of reasons. One being that 
when our lives are really busy and hectic or stressful or challenging, it can be difficult to feel connected to our sensuality, to our sexual desires, to pleasure, um, erotic pleasure. And it brings us back to that, which then benefits the rest of our lives. So an erotic ritual could be so many different things. Some examples might be, you know, eye gazing with a partner. Um, maybe you do that every once in a while or only when sex is feeling like it's a really stressful time and we still want to connect. We're going to start this way. It can be listening to certain sultry music during sex, um, whether it's by yourself or with partners. And I think some of the most powerful ones really are on our own because it's kind of the fill your own cup first idea. Um, I think we have more to give and experience when we prioritize our own self-pleasure. And so for you, it might be something like um, having a self-pleasure session every month where you also meditate on your goals. Some people call that orgasm magic. Uh, it could be that you sensually put this really lovely uh, lotion on your skin and it smells like something that feels very sexy to you. Um, it can involve sex, but it doesn't have to. It just has to tap into your sexual desires and or your sensual pleasure. Um, yeah, so I think they're really powerful and I'm excited to talk with Jamila about them uh, for, for everyone at the event. And when you say ritual, is there a number of times, like you, I think you just said, you said monthly, like, could it be daily, monthly? Does it, does that part matter or is it, is, is what matters that it's something you repeat and that you kind of get familiar with? I think it is the coming back to it at whatever interval. That said, there might be some things that feel right to you to incorporate on a regular, you know, basis. So for example, if tapping into your own sexuality, just even for a few moments, every night before bed or every day when you wake up, if that feels good, then go with it. Um, I don't think it needs to be scheduled on a strict, you know, this is how often you should do it kind of basis. The important thing is that it is something that you can return to, that you're aware of. And it may even be that something in your life is what kind of um, triggers you to to go there. So maybe it's every time you have a headache. <laughs> um, it, can, it can turn something that's really challenging into something beautiful. I just thought of like, the, you know, the power pose. I don't know if everyone knows and I'm not gonna try to do it because I might do it wrong, but <laughs> I mean, forget who's, was it Brene Brown? Is it? it was actually, what is her name? A sociologist. I know what you're talking about. It was like, it's like the superwoman. Yeah. There's yeah. this thing called the power pose um, that you it suggested I apologize that I'm not cutting the person. I didn't plan to say this, but um, uh, before you give, you know, give a talk or do something, you know, you're nervous about. And I'm like curious if it's, if this is like the sexual equivalent or erotic equivalent of like a power pose, like something to kind of get you, not necessarily, well, I guess maybe in the mood, but just ready to be in that space. Because I know for me, certainly often like I want to want to have sex, but my brain is going a million miles a minute and I can't. Like, I'm like, oh, let me finish these like three emails that I have to send. Otherwise, it's really hard for me to stop thinking about them to like go into that other, like not dimension, but that space. So, you know, I think if I, 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 I'm going to take something away from this, I'm sure I'm looking forward to hearing you talk more about it because, and I, I do also think that for a lot of women and femmes, and maybe it's an ADHD thing, but it is very hard to like, kind of make that leap even when you want to sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's such a good point. And I think that can be a really powerful use of ritual. For some people, it's just, you know, to have fun and do this ritual, but then they can be very functional in that way. And so if you do have this really busy mind or you have a lot going on, I think it can be something that brings you into that space. And then your body remembers, you know? So for example, before sex, sometimes I like to use a particular toy by myself and I love that. And it actually, I think even just thinking about the toy now, I can be like, oh, I think I'm kind of turned on. Like we start to develop these neural pathways. Um, it could even be like a certain chocolate you have before sex, you know, something that just entices you. I think that's a really, really meaningful use. And I just remembered, I think, I think the sociologist's last name is Cuddy. 
uh, C U D D Y. But yeah, I think that's powerful. Use it, use it in a way that it's going to um, add more to your sex life and to your overall life. I like that. It's like muscle memory or memory, I guess, that you associate whatever it is. And I like that you said chocolate because that's that's something easy. I think sometimes people hear something like that and they're like, oh, it's like a whole thing I have to do. And it doesn't, it could be if you want it to be, but it doesn't have to be like a major thing. It's kind of just a, a symbol in a way of something to get you in that space. Well, I'm definitely now looking forward to hearing more and I'm sure our readers and listeners are too. Um, before we uh, end, I want to know what, what are you working on next? Well, I'm really excited uh, to be coming up on our break <laughs> of a holiday break, which uh, I hope everyone's able to find some ease this season. And then I'm steamrolling back in with my podcast is my main focus. And I'm working on, I have another series of orgasm stories coming up and I have a dominatrix journey coming up. I think that's going to be the first episode next year. So yeah, I'm super excited about those and um, about just seeing, you know, where this all leads next, because so much of what I do comes from interacting with folks. And I'm hoping that at the event too, that'll happen. That's great. And I just one more um, quick thing. How do you, uh, how do you find these topics? Like, is it just things you're curious about or people getting in touch with you or things you hear about? Yeah, it's a mix of those things. I am so grateful to hear from a lot of folks nowadays where they write to me and they, they email me and they say, hey, this is what I'm going through. I want to talk about it. Or this is what I'm going through. Can you cover it? <laughs> and so I, I find that one of the most important parts of an audio program is listening to your listeners more so than anything else. Um, so that's where I start. And then my own curiosity and also what's happening in the world. If I just hear about some new thing that I'm, you know, haven't heard about before, I will, I will delve into it. And then I survey my listeners regularly too, through my email list. Thank you so much, August. We're looking forward to hearing you February 11th and everyone listening, watching, if you'd like to win two VIP tickets to hear August speak at the Residence Love and Desire Summit, uh, follow August. Um, at, on social media. I'm going to let her say her handles in a moment. And you can follow Residence 11 at Residence 11 on Twitter. That's R E S I D E N C E E L E D E N on Twitter and um, for a chance to win. And August will be posting the winner. Can you tell us where to find you on Twitter and elsewhere? Yeah. So you can either just search for Girl Boner and August McLaughlin will show up. Um, but on Instagram, it's McLaughlin, it's MC Laugh, L-I-N, August like the month, August McLaughlin. That's where I'll post the giveaway today. And I hope folks will comment so that they can win a ticket. I think that would be fun. Um, yeah. And you can find me on all the, all the platforms through those names. And you can also comment in the next 24 hours on this conversation and we'll be picking a winner to for a ticket to the Desire Summit there and visit uh, summit.residence11.com to get more information on the summit and who else will be speaking. Thank you so much, August. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone at, at uh, your company, too. I'm super excited.